Hello, good afternoon. This is the second part of the GLG 334 Geology of Nigeria um, lecture videos for the structural geology part of the course. And we had already looked at in the previous video the structural features of the Nigerian basement. We'll now look in general at the structural features of Nigerian sedimentary basins. So I would go over this quickly and I wouldn't really go into as much detail as I would want to given our time constraints, but um, we would mention a number of things that are important in understanding the structural features of Nigerian sedimentary basins. So again, we're going to put all of this in a, in, in a, in a regional context, which is the African con con context. Now, the Nigerian sedimentary basins are African sedimentary basins, and African sedimentary basins that developed in the Phanerozoic. Now, we know what the Phanerozoic is. Phanerozoic is the eon that is after the Precambrian eon. So the Phanerozoic basins that developed on the African continent can be grouped into four. Into four. We have what is known as the divergent passive marginal basins, under which we have wrench, Delta Xag, full belt, ETC. We have what is known as the intracratonic interior sag basins. I will explain what all this means. We have what is known as the intracratonic fracture basins. And we have what are known as the cratonic foreland basins. Now, brief explanation. Um, the divergent passive margin basins, if you remember the preamble video, and again, please watch that preamble video to understand that preamble video of the regional geology concept concepts to understand some of the terms that are being used here so divergent passive margin basins are basically what they are they are formed on passive margins divergent passive margins divergent in the sense that you're dealing with continental margins that have been separated from another continental margin by the formation of an ocean basin so they basically form the the transition from continent to ocean in a passive margin. So it's not a subduction zone. So the key characteristic of this margin is that as the divergent passive margin of the continent moves away from the mid-oceanic ridge, you get a progressive cooling and sinking of the continental margin. Now that sinking, that sinking or subsidence creates accommodation space where um, a thick pile of sedimentary deposits called the divergent passive marginal wedge is deposited. So in Africa, the Atlantic coast of Africa and the Indian Ocean coast of Africa are basically passive margins because they form when, for example, for the Atlantic side, when North America and South America are separated from Africa in the Triassic to the Cretaceous, and also in the Jurassic period when India and Madagascar separated from Eastern Africa. So these basins are very, very thick. They are basins that have been, they've not have been affected by thermal activity. So their thermal profiles and their geothermal gradients are, are, are relatively low. And then there are also three types. There are three basic types. You have the wrench basins because some of these Atlantic margin basins, especially in the Atlantic margin, affected by strike slip faults. These strike slip faults were precursors and extend into the current transform faults in the Atlantic. So these rain vision, this, this strike slip movement have affected the margin basins. Also, you have what are known as the delta exact basins. Now the sediments that form the passive margins are sediments that come from the erosion of the continental crust, which is on the surface, which is exposed to erosion. Now, in some places, you have big rivers that flow into the ocean. And at the point where they flow into the ocean, they deposit the sediments that they've been bringing from the interior. And the sediment is a lot. Now, these sediments form what are known as deltas. Now, the weight of this sediment adds an extra subsidence to the already subsiding basin, which leads to extremely thick amounts of sediment. And that's why they are called deltaic sag, because the weight of the sediment sags the lithosphere and causes extra subsidence. The prime example of a deltaic sag basin in Africa is the Niger Delta. 
in Niger Delta. Okay. Now, within Africa, within the African continent, you have broad regions. Because remember, we said Africa is basically underlain by basements, the largest continent, the largest amount of basements on any continent. And you have broad regions where you have where the 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 lithosphere or where the crust has sagged. So you have broad basin basinal sags. And these basinal sags have over a certain period of time been covered by shallow oceans or by shallow seas. And these shallow seas have deposited very, very thick sequences of relatively flat and extensive intracontinental sag basin deposits. So these deposits belong to the intracontinent, intracratonic interior sag basins. And a good example is your is the Chad basin in northern Nigeria and the Sokoto basin or the Lumiden basin in northwestern Nigeria. Then within the continent, within the continental crust, you have areas where you are, where you've had rifting. Rifting basically has to do with the formation of fractures into the lithosphere as a result of extension. Now, you have several rift systems in Africa, three to be precise. You have the West African rift system, you have the Karoo rift system, and then you have the East African rift system. And these rift systems usually precede periods of continental breakup. It's just that the West African rift system, which is the one that is of importance to us because one of the rift basins which belong to the West African rift system is the Bay Metrof, which is the most important basin, sedimentary basin in Nigeria. So these are intracratonic fracture basins. The cratonic foreland basins, we touched upon it in the, when we talked about the basement, and we know what foreland basins are. So foreland basins are basins that are on the edge of orogenic belts. And they form as a result of the sag in the crust as a result of the weight of the mountain belt. And they usually take in sediment that is eroded from the mountain belt. An example of a cratonic foreland basin is the Volta basin. We do not have any cratonic foreland basins in Nigeria. Okay, so this is a map showing the different types of basins. We would look at this in more detail when we look at the geology of Africa in a regional geology course in, your, in the next session. So, general overview. The sedimentary basins of Nigeria are Mesozoic to Cenozoic in age, and they form a relatively thin veneer of sediments on top of the Pan African basement, covering a third of Nigeria. Now, this is that map again that we saw when we looked at the basement, and the, the, you can see the regions, narrow, usually narrow regions, peripheral regions where the basement is covered by a veneer of sediments or Cretaceous to um, recent age. So this is another map showing the different basins. And we can see that from the north, we have the Bonu Chad Basin, the Benue Full Belt, the Anambra Basin, the, the Niger Delta, and the Sokoto Basin, or the Illumiden Basin. OK, so let's look at the Benue Trough. Because the Benue Trough is the most important basin, because all the other basins, one way or the other, are related to the Benue Trough except the Bono and Chad Basin and the Sokoto Embayment, which are more or less peripheral parts of wider basins within northern Nigeria, Niger, and the Sahara Desert. Aside those two basins, the rest of the basins are closely related to the Bay Neutral. Their genesis and their deposits are closely related to the formation of the Bay Neutral. And that is why our focus is going to be on the Bay Neutral. So what's the Bay Neutral? The Bay Neutral is an intracontinental elongated basin that is 100 kilometers long and up to 250 kilometers as its widest. It trends in the northeast-southwest direction from the southwest where it is covered by the Younger Anambra Basin and the Niger Delta Basin to the northeast where it is covered by the Chad Basin. It can be, it's divided into northern, central, and southern. Now, this is something that it's always good to remember. If you look at certain literature, especially older literature, the term used is lower, middle, and upper. 
to represent southern, central, and northern, respectively. Now, these terms are not advisable to use because in geology, lower, middle, and upper are stratigraphic terms. So somebody who is not aware will interpret your calling, will interpret the terms lower, middle, and upper to signify age. So the lower Benue trough is older than is older than the middle Benue trough, which is also older than the upper Benue trough, which is not true. What these terms are actually meant to signify are geographical terms. Upper meaning north, meaning middle meaning central, and lower meaning south. And that is why it is better to use the proper geographic terms to distinguish it from stratigraphic terms. And that is why we use northern, central, and southern. And this definition and this distinction is based on tectonic differences, geographical differences, and also stratigraphic con con consideration. Even though there is a bit of, there's some continuity between all three parts of the Bene trough because it's one continuous structure. Now, this is a map. Um, it's not clear, not a very clear map, but it's a map showing basically the general extent of the Bene trough. So, general structure of the Bene trough. Um, from gravity and aeromagnetic data, because most of the Bene trough is sediment, and we haven't, we, we, we don't have exposed the basin, the structure of the basement, or the basin for basement forming structure of the Bene trough. But we can be able to see this from gravity and aeromagnetic data, and we see that the Bene trough is not just one continuous basin or one continuous trough, but it is made up of several, up to twenty three sub basins separated by axial faults. These sub-basins appear to be rhomb-shaped and are disposed on echelon in the northeast, the southwest. So it means that when we're looking at the thickness, when we look at the thickness of the Benetra, we cannot just really say a general thickness. You have the regions, these sub-basins, where the Benetra is thickest, and then the axial height where the Benetra is thinnest. The thickness kind of can reach up to 10,000 meters especially towards the southwest, where you have the Anambra Basin and the Niger Delta Basin. Now, these axial faults seem to be in continuity with the oceanic fracture zones, especially the Chin and Chakot, which extend from the Mid-Atlantic into the Bay Trough. And these fracture zones are related to the origin of the Bay Trough. The major linearments in the Bay Trough are between 040 and 073. This is the dominant trend in the Bene trough. 040 has to do with the northeast southwest while 073 is more to the 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 east northeast and west southwest there is also a secondary meridian trend now meridian basically means east west when you hear meridian it means um, um uh, sorry meridian means north south your meridian, remember what your meridian is. So it means north south. So there's a secondary north south trend and appears to be conjugate to the main trend. Okay, so this is basically a model, structural model of the Bay Trough. And then you see the basement ridge areas and then the basins, and the basins which are disposed in different parts around the basement ridges. And you can see that north-south and also that meridian trend that is found in the Bay trough. These are cross-sections. These are cross-sections showing the disposition of different units in the Bay trough. Okay, so let's look in detail at the different parts of the Bay trough. So starting with the southern. The major structural features in the southern basin Bay trough are the Abakalik Antikrinurum, which is formed by tightly folded Aptian to Santonian sediments. Being an anti anticlinarium, the Abakaliki anticlinarium is flanked by the Athico syncline to the southeast and the Anambra syncline to the northwest. And then they are covered by, which are covered by younger sediments of the Anambra basin. Now this folding of the Abakaliki anti anticlinarium happened in the Santonian. It also plunges southwest beneath the Anambra basin. To the east of the um, to the east of the southern Bene Trough, on the eastern side of the southern Bene Trough is what is known as the Manfe embayment, which is northwest southeast, northwest southeast. 
And then also, the Arbacalic antigranerum terminates at the buccal line where the penetroph seems to be offset to the northwest. Now, so this is a basically a structural map of the um, uh, of the Abacalic antigranerum and the southern penetroph. And you can see the Abacalic antigranerum as a central anticlinoral structure, and then the Anam Afipocincline or Afipocincranerum, and then the Anambra syncline, which contains the sediments that form the Anambra basin. So um, other basins that are related to the southern building trough are the Anambra basin, which is which contains undeformed carbonate to maturation sediments formed at the flanks of the Abacalic anticlinorium. Um, also related to the Anambra basin is the more recent Niger Delta basin, which is a deltaic buildup, which started from the Paleogene and extends across the continental margin of Africa into the Atlantic Ocean. The structures in the Niger Delta as well as the Anambra Basin are seen sedimentary, extensional, and contractional faults. Now, these are opposed to the basin, basement involved structures in the Benetroph, for example. The structures in the Niger Delta are structures that have to do with the loading of sediment, especially because they are rapidly de de deposited in a rapidly subsiding basin. So there's instability, especially because at the bottom of the sediment, you have shales. You have um, shale units, mobile shale units, which become very, very mobile under compression, and which leads to the formation of extensional structures and contractual, stru contractual st structures near shore and offshore. And then flanking the Niger Delta to the east and west are the coastal Calabar flank and the Dahomey basins, which are northwest, southwest, and east-west. And they form part of the equatorial Atlantic passive margin. So they are not part of the bathing trough, but the equatorial Atlantic margin. OK, so these are some diagrams. I must admit that the diagrams in these slides are not really good, but it's something that with subsequent videos, and with subsequent sessions, we might upgrade. Um, this is of the Niger Delta, the Niger Delta. So cross sections of the Niger Delta to show its structure and its flanks. And the, the thing to notice, especially in the lower diagram, that the structures in the Niger Delta are within the sediments and do not have, are not, do not have anything to do with the basement. They are within the sediments. Is a sighting section of the of the of the Niger Delta, and you see that the structures are controlled by the mobile shields at the bottom of the Akata formation. Now, these mobile shields form a detachment unit where the upper the the upper sediment, which are mainly sand shields and sands, continental sands on top, the upper sediment form either extensional structures or contractional structures. The central Benue Trough occupies the central linear portion of the Benue Trough, north of the linear portion of the Benue Trough, north of Boko to Makodi. Now, the major structural uh, element in the central Benue Trough is the Kiana Anticline, which is formed by Albion to Sedimentian rocks. It is flanked to the north by a deep basin known as the Kardako Basin and southwards by the Bukhari Basin, which of both of them being slightly deformed. The Boko line offsets the Abakalik domain from the rest of the Bay Metro. So this is a simple geologic map and cross-section of the central Bay Metro showing the Kiana anticline and the synclines on both flanks. Now the northern Benue Trough occupies the northernmost part of the the northern Benue Trough occupies the northernmost part of the Benue Trough and can be subdivided into several smaller units. There is a Kantungo Inlayer, and Inlayer is basically a unit of older rocks surrounded by younger rocks. So the Kantungo Inlayer is formed by a host of basement rocks and separates two domains, which are basically like two basins, two sub basins, the Dadia Laub domain. So situated in the south, and the um, Pindiga Gombe Basin towards the north. Northeast of the Kaltugo Inlaya are small basement ridges, for example, the Sambuk and the Gombe ridges, 
which are separated by small deep basins. Also, you have the Gongola and Yola branches where the baby trough digitizes or separates into two arms. To the northwest of the upper baby trough, of the northern baby trough, as you see, I made the same mistake, I made the same error. You have Paleocene flatline Kerikeri basin, which rests unconformably on the old, upon the folded Cretaceous unit of the um, northern baby trough. The Gongola arm of the northern baby trough extends beneath the Chad basin, where it may be connected to other basins of the West African reef system. In the Adama basin, there are several. In the Adama Massif to the east are several isolated Cretaceous basins on the Nigerian Cameroon brother, and they are filled by Cretaceous sediments and volcanics. Okay, so let's basically look at the origin of the Bayou Trough. Let's look at the origin of the Bayou Trough. Now, if you read older literature, if you read older literature, especially um, literature from the 50s all the way down to the 80s, you would see an evolution in our understanding of the Bayou Trough. The early views of the origin of the Bayou Trough were pre-plate tectonic ideas. These ones were in the 50s, early 60s, because plate tectonics basically actually became established as the theory explaining the Earth's crust in the late Cretaceous, in, sorry, in the late 60s, early 70s, 1970s. So it was in that, after that point that we now started giving ideas as to how the Bayou Trough would have formed. Now, the, the earliest plate tectonics um, uh, understanding of the Bayou Trough is the plate tectonic field drift arm of the triple junction that formed during the opening of the Atlantic. This was the early understanding. And a lot of people still hold on to this understanding. But the understanding was flawed because it did not take into consideration certain things. Well, it did not take, into, take them into consideration at the time because these things had not been observed at the time because there hadn't been extensive field work done in the region. So it was with extensive field work, especially done by people who are known as the French School of Structural Geologists, especially in the northern Bayou Trough, where a different idea began to form. And this new ideas were, were joined with um, information coming from aeromagnetic studies and geophysics. So some of the things that point, some of the evidences that point to, we cannot give this the, the field rift out of the tri triple junction explanation, which is basically that the Bayou Trough is an extensional rift basin, just like the Eastern, East, East African Rift Valley, where certain things, for example, most of the faults observable in the Bayou Trough, they display transcurrent, that is strike slip, rather than normal displacement. And there are large throws, you know, strike slip fault to talk about the throw, resulted from compressive events that occurred after the initiation of the trough. You do not see things like this in rift basins, pure rift basins. Also, you have a host and graben, graben structure, which shows that there is there are both axial and marginal faults. The structuration of the underlying basement complex into Sorry, please hold on. So due to, um, um, so there's a structure, structuration of the underlying basement complex into small basins or sub-basins controlled by faults trending 060, 130. And then some of them are initially filled with conglomerates of alluvial fan origin. Also, some of the sub-basins, some of the sub-basin bounding faults are marked associated with the same depositional volcanics, volcanics. That there is also the correlation of the central axial high with the Charcot fracture zone, which may allow for the suggestion that the northwestern edge of the Bayou Trough is defined by or corresponds to the chain fracture zone. The major faults are believed and have been observed, especially in the Kaltungo Inlaya, to be reactivated Pan-African share zones in the basement. Also, the final evidence that the Bayou Trough also forms part of a more extensive West and Central African rift system, 
made up of genetically related basins formed as a result of differential movement of different parts of the African plate during the breakup of Gondwana land. And this is basically a kind of model that shows how the Benue trough formed. And this is also the relationship between the Benue trough and the West and Central African basins on the West and Central African rift system. So evolutionary stages, let's just go quickly over evolutionary stages and end this video. So there's early magnetic activity that starts the formation of the trough. And the evidence for this early magnetic activity are intrusions like the Burashika complex and the rhyolites of the Andes and their ages. Then you had the creation of pre-Albian gravel-like basins with continental deposits. Now, some of these uh, basins are visible in northern Cameroon, but they're only suspected in the Benue Trough because the upper Altian sediments are, have covered them in most parts of the basin. Then, the Albion was a period where the Benue Trough was evolved into a unique basin controlled by northeast and southwest faults reactivated from the Pan Africa. Um, there was deepening of the basins at the releasing bends of the fault and uplift at the restraining, restraining bends of the transcurrent fault. Since sedimentary deposition affected, deformation affected mainly the Albion shales and the basal Turonian sediments. Magmatism occurred during the Albion, particularly in the southern segment. In the northern segment, magmatism was resisted, restricted to releasing bends along transcurrent faults. There was also a phase of lead zinc mineralization which occurred from the Albion to the Turonian, especially along the north-south trending tensional fractures in areas of high subsidence. There were also transgressions, especially in the Turonian, which could produce a seaway that connected the Atlantic Ocean to the Tethys, passing through the Bay Trough. There was also low-grade metamorphism that affected parts of the Abakaliki area, lasting from the Albion to Santonia. The Santonia tectonic phase was important, but largely geographically restricted to the southern Bay Trough and part of the central segment. It was accompanied by low grade metamorphism and magmatism. The Santonia phase led to a shift in the depot center from the Abakalki Basin to the Anambra Basin on the flanks of the newly formed and uplifted Anticlinorian. There was also a bit of magmatic activity after the Santonia in the southern Benue Trough. At the end, the end of the magician was marked by the second compressive event, which affected exclusively the northern Benue Trough, but was not accompanied by metamorphism and magmatism. So this is basically a short summary of the structural features of the Nigerian sedimentary basins. And we ended this with a bit of the evolution of the, of the, of the Benue Trough. And I hope this video will be able to cover what we will have covered in the class. And I hope it will help you to prepare very well for the exam. Have a nice day.